Welcome to Where the Harris is. I'm your host, Ryan Harris, along with the other hosts, Chris Harris Jr., Super Bowl champion, and current Browns player, Shelby Harris. Well, fellas, let's get started with first down, and a monster first down has been announced. Devontae Adams traded to the Jets for a conditional third-round pick. Your thoughts? I think it's huge. You know, obviously, it's not going to be as big as people think it is, but I just think having that receiver of that pedigree being there, taking the load off of Garrett Wilson, Alan Lazard, and all those guys, I think it's going to be a big a, a big upgrade. But that's not necessarily their issue. They got to find a way to protect Aaron Rodgers. You know, you've got the 40-year-old quarterback getting hit, you know, not just getting hit, getting getting drilled. And you got to find a way to preserve him throughout the season because if he keeps getting hit like this, he won't make it the rest of the season. I think it's a steal. Whenever you can get an impact player like this for a third-round pick, mm-hmm. that's a steal, you know. So uh, hopefully, of course, he makes the Jets a better team. But like Shelby said, they, they have a lot of other issues. You know, their their run game is inconsistent. You know, Hall, one, one week he's up, and next week, uh, you know, he disappears. And uh, their O-line just can't block. You know, he doesn't have a lot of time to throw. And also, Aaron Rodgers just isn't the same Aaron Rodgers. Correct. Right? He's not mobile anymore as, as he used to, you know. Uh, he was more – people People got to realize, man, he was he was kind of a scrambling quarterback, mm-hmm. you know, that could that could throw, you know. And you, and you take that that mobility away from him, now he's a pocket passer. And they don't have a, a, a great offensive line. So, this is a huge pickup, I think. It's a steal to be able to get him for a third-round pick. Well, with Devontae Adams, I'm with you, Chris, a steal. What are the Raiders doing? I mean, you don't yeah. get you, you don't get Wilson or Lazard in return for this deal. I mean, the yeah. Raiders are gonna Raider. That's what everybody in the NFL knows. So that's the first part of it. Uh, the second part, though, I mean, this makes the Jets a considerable contender for a championship. Look, they're two field goals away from winning the game Monday night against the Bills, right? That's that's something where you score touchdowns and you got to put it on the kicker, right? So the red zone offense has to change, but they did look markedly better against the Bills. With the run game, Brees Hall running up the middle, pitching it to the weak side. I love those kinds of runs. And then also he can catch the ball. But this is going to make the Jets very, very championship contending worthy. And it's going to be fun to see what happens. Man, I, always, speaking of, go ahead. I always think that, you know, when you trade a bona fide star for picks, just like it makes me think about the Khalil Mack trade. You traded yes. all those picks for Khalil Mack. Uh, the Raiders did and got – I don't even think a single player from that trade is still on the roster. And you never know what you're going to get. You never, like, you know, everyone always talks about, you know, you have to develop those picks, but do they have the personnel in place to develop them? And I think the biggest reason why you didn't get any players in return is the Jets are on the hook for the rest of his contract. The Raiders yeah. are not taking any of any money off, uh, from that deal. So I think, you know, it, it could end up being – a good trade for both, but you know, just like you said, it has to be a steal because you're getting a Hall of Fame receiver for a third round pick, and that could turn to a second. We're not talking about any first round; we're talking about a third round pick that could turn to a second. If if that's what it takes to get a Hall of Fame player in return, man, anybody would jump on that. Yeah, make that deal a hundred times out of a yeah. hundred. Well, speaking of champions, Chris Harris Jr., you got a champions welcome as you came home to the Denver Broncos to retire. Walk us through the experience. Man, it was a great experience going back to Denver. You know, uh, me and my wife and my team, marketing team, just, you know, we had a great conversation at the uh, end of the, uh, at the beginning of the year and just wanted to be able to, you know, make amends and be able to come home and uh, um, the same thing with them, same thing with the Broncos. And we just uh, set this up and, they just happened to be the Chargers and the Broncos game, both teams I played for, you know. <laughs> uh, but it was good to see both teams, you know, uh, be able to see it because I got a lot of teammates that still play with the Chargers. And then I still got some teammates that play with the with the Broncos and then coaches on both teams. So it was good to see both uh, teams. And But, you know, man, just seeing how we came out and played, man, it hurt, man, because <laughs> we didn't come out with that fire, you know, that intensity that, that I wanted to see, you know, and uh, – and, and, that's what it takes in those championship games, those conference game, division games. But other than that, man, it was great. It was a great experience. It was great seeing uh, all the, you know, all the equipment people flip and yeah. uh, the trainers and things like that. I haven't seen those guys since 2019, you know, yeah. or spoken to those people. And that's a, that's a, it's, so it's been quite a, a long time. So 
it was good to get back for sure. Man, I think it was a, I think well, it was you, a real, real special thing just because you did so much for the organization. You know, there is no yeah. Super Bowl without Chris Harris Jr. You know what yeah. I mean? So I just think yeah. that this and all for you to go and retire at home, you know, at, at home, they finally brought yeah. you home. And now next we talk about Ring of Honor and all that stuff. But this is the first step to showing you the love that you deserve. So congrats, my boy. You really deserve that. Thank you. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate now, you. I want to dig in, though. You said, you know, you, you wanted to make amends with the Broncos. I mean, tell the people what was painful yeah. for you leaving the Broncos yeah. or, or before leaving the Broncos? Yeah, man, because, you know, a lot of people th- thought it was just like the last year, you know, but we have been trying to get a deal done for two two or three years before that, you know, so it was just, uh, you know, when things like that contract negotiations and, you know, and how it was running at that time and, you know, we had, it was controversy going on with the front office, you know, with L.A. Joe Ellis and the Bolins. It was a lot going on. Right, especially at the end of my career. So uh, a lot of things could have gotten misconstrued and, you know, and, you know, I felt some type of way. Elway probably felt some type of way, you know. So we just kind of let all that stuff be bygones, be bygones, and it was able to just make those amends. And, you know, we got a lot to celebrate. I feel like we have way more to celebrate than, you know, to look back on the negative, you know, uh, having five straight division titles, you know, going having multiple Super Bowl appearances and, uh, so it was just uh, we we it went to ninety games, right? I won ninety games in nine years in Denver. That's you know uh, that's hard to do. So uh, just being able to come back and just celebrate the success that we had, uh, it it was definitely fun. Yeah, I don't well, think I the people story. realize. Come on, bro. I don't think the people realize is how personal sometimes these negotiations can get because yeah, it it can go it, it, you know as as alpha males as you have to be to play this sport. They don't realize that uh, when you're in the contract negotiations, they be say, uh, they, they'll say, oh, well, I don't think you're that good to, to be able to make this. I don't think you're, and then you'd be like, what? I, I, I'm an all pro player. What do you, like, what do you mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So they don't realize like they, yeah. these, these contract negotiations can get, can get messy because there's going to be some words thrown around. It's going to be, you know, things said that are definitely going to be disrespectful. And yeah. you kind of find out exactly how they feel about you. And it's like, well, if you feel about me that way, then maybe I should go somewhere else. And so, mm-hmm. you know, that's why yeah. it's such a big deal that you were able to squash this and throw it under the rug and come back. Because we've all yeah. been there. We've all had had, yeah. had had to talk to the teams about about how what they think our value is. And, and sometimes, you know, that hurts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not, and I, I mean, you talk about a lot of things to celebrate, Chris. I mean, we, I could celebrate you as a teammate – you know, the rest of the episode in terms of, you know, he, you always had a smile. You would talk trash, but in like the fun <laughs> kind of way, you know, would let, let everybody know that you were there, but, you know, that you expected better play, you know, from the opponent. Oh, yeah. you can't do that. Come on. You got to be better than that. The big smile at the knocking down a pass and, and of <laughs> course, getting everybody to the Rick Ross concert after the Super Bowl, man. Those those stories, we're going to keep them under lock. Yeah. But, man, you were uh, an, yeah. a Hall of Fame teammate, brother in addition to a Hall of Fame player in my book. And like Shelby said, I think the Ring of Honor is just a matter of time for you. And it's amazing what you did to come back with your family and to retire a Bronco. Appreciate y'all, man. And, you know, I always tried to be that teammate that just, you knew I was going to bring that competitive edge, right, that I was going to fight, you know. And I think if you you can have that as a teammate, right, though that's a lasting memory right that hey 100%. chris harris was a guy that was gonna fight for my he was gonna fight for me fight for the team you know try to win every battle so that was always try to be my mindset is to be a competitor and i think that's how you can play a long time right if you can compete fight every down you know shelby gonna be able to we'll, we'll still be doing this podcast five years <laughs> later you still be in the league you know yeah. what i mean so that's just uh that's that was that's how i was able to play and Let's go to the next game. You know, we had enough talk about me. Let's get to this big showdown, yeah. right, that we had this weekend. Uh, Lamar Jackson versus Jaden Daniels. They're calling Jaden Daniels Lamar 2.0, right? And their games do look kind of similar. Yes. But I think Jaden can throw. I think he's a little bit ahead of Lamar at this time period of throwing. But it was I, – I, I think this game was all about Derrick Henry. What do y'all think about this matchup, this crazy matchup that we had over the weekend? Go ahead, Joe. But I think, you know, it's just, it's it's the first of many, 
you're, this is not the yes, last sir. you're going to hear Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels <laughs> is going to be a a how like a household MVP candidate years to come. You know, he's he's starting mm-hmm. to come into his own. But the one thing I got to say about him though is, as long as he has stable coaching, we know how it goes in the league. Once coaches mm-hmm. start leaving yeah. and, and you know start getting new jobs and stuff, we get a new offense in there, and it takes a year or two to get up to speed. But like I said, like you said though, Derrick Henry was was the was the story of this game. Man, he's he's on an unstoppable pace right now. You know, he leads the league in carries, leads, leads the league in touchdowns. You know, it's just he's really just doing it all for them. He's taking the burden off off Lamar Jackson. He's doing exactly you know what we thought he was going to do, but then after that first game, people start questioning it. They're like, ah, I don't know how it's going to work, but they're figuring it out. And then their defense is playing good ball too. You know, I, I hate to try to t- take credit for it, but I think we kind of showed how to slow Jaden Daniels down a little bit on the RPO and all that stuff. You know, mm-hmm. the, us as the Browns. But, man, the, the Ravens are really coming into their own. You know, we doubted them the first two weeks because, you know, they lost to the Chiefs and then they lost to the Raiders. And we're like, oh, who is this team? <laughs> you know, who is this team? Right. But they're starting to come into their own and, and, and they're deadly. And I look at Jaden Daniels. He's not as shifty as Lamar. But, man, he's, he's, a, he's bigger. He's, th- like, thicker. And he, 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 can run, he can run through contact. But, man, he can throw the ball. I'm gonna tell you that, like Lamar can yeah, throw the ball. Throw. I remember when we played him in Denver, and I remember, I remember, oh my God, Vic was like, "Oh, it was when Holly, Hollywood Brown had just dropped a huge couple of passes the week before." And he's like, "Ah, oh, he can't catch, you know, he can't catch." And then literally on the first in the first quarter, he went through a bomb on us. Hollywood Brown lays out perfect, perfect pass, lays out for a touchdown. And I was like, "I guess he could catch then." But, yeah, <laughs> but truly, like it was, you know, he he he. Lamar Jackson's a great passer. But Jaden Daniels, he he just has he has that it factor also. So I, you know, I love it. I, yeah. I can't wait to see more battles between them. But Lamar and the Ravens just have a more complete team right now. And with that run game, with Derrick Henry hitting that stride, it's scary. Yeah. Let's talk. Let's talk about that stride that Derrick Henry's in. I mean, his 706 rushing yards going into the Monday night game was more than 12 other teams had total. His eight mm. touchdowns was more than tw- – his eight rushing touchdowns are more than 26 other teams' rushing touchdowns totals. Mm. I mean, come on. This is – he's going to get 1,000 yards in six, seven games here, seven, eight games. So, Derrick Henry, you guys are absolutely right. He is powering this Baltimore Ravens engine, and it finally looked like against the commanders it was starting to click. I mean, I want to pick up on one more thing that Shelby said. I mean, Jaden Daniels was so good. The NFL front office is thinking about primetime games next year for the Commanders, right? I mean, how long has it yeah. been since you've seen those kind of primetime games with the Commanders? And it's because of Jaden Daniels. So wonderful that the NFL had this matchup, an incredible game. And, and, and like Shelby said, it's just the start of this matchup. What do you think, Chris? And it's a battle of that, like that East Coast territory, you know? Yes. And the Commanders and the Ravens aren't too far apart. From each other. Bus ride. Right? Yeah, you know, so. Yeah, but the, the main thing, Derrick Henry, being able to, now they're putting him in the home base. They're putting him in the pistol in the home. Putting him right behind uh, Lamar Jackson, right? And he's comfortable now. And uh, it's not like the Ravens haven't been the best running team in the league over the pretty much this past decade. Yeah. You know, they pretty much led the league in rushing almost every year, right? Now you add this monster a MVP type guy to their to the mix, uh, they're pretty much you know unstoppable now with him rolling, and the thing and they're adding the play action, right? The play now this play action game is coming in the fold for Lamar Jackson, and guys are running free. Uh, that's what I've seen. So it's it's opening up for him. Jay Nails, he's going to just continue to get better, uh, but he needs a little bit a little bit more run game if they're going to be able to compete with Lamar Jackson. Yeah, I want I want to ask though. You got two defensive legends in the nfl here i always love when that running backs at home because the because then the calls are less on the defense but what does it do as a defense when the quarterback's under center even in that pistol and you don't know what side the running backs on what are you guys thinking as defenders man that's tough because you know i love the shotgun please run the ball on shotgun because you're telling me exactly what mm-hmm. kind of blocks i'm gonna get you know what I mean? like if the, if the back is away from you you know all right the main way they can run it is towards you and so you got yeah. already know the old lineman's going to move towards you. You already know you might get a double, and he's going he's going to bump off to the linebacker. But when the backs at home, 
Like when you got pistol or anything like that, you literally are in no man's land and you got to truly just play football. And that, that gives mm-hmm. the advantage to the offense. Anytime you can take any key away from the defense and make them play a tick slower, that, that just changes the game. But then also you add Lamar Jackson into that mix where you really can, let's say you're in pistol and you, and you do a QB naked, you, you fake it and just run. You're going one way and the, and the quarterback's going another way. Or the fact of this is like you got you can't do a light box against them. So then that just makes it that all, everyone else is more more crucial. You know what I mean? So it's just yeah. – and, the, and then you also the – the thing with the Ravens, they have two really good tight ends. So that means mm. they can go 12 personnel the whole game, and you have to stay in base. And they got they got tight ends that can be receivers. Man, the, the Ravens have so much yeah. scheme versatility that it, it puts teams in a, in a bind. And, and, and that's what you're kind of yeah. seeing here. You can't account for everybody. Somebody has to be able to get loose. And, and – Right now, it's Derrick Henry. That play action changes the game, Ryan, because that's yeah. something that Lamar never leaned on. Yeah. Right? It, you know, they took shots, and they, they tried to go deep with Hollywood Brown or find Andrews uh, in the middle of the field through zones and things like that. But he hadn't had a play action like this, right? Everybody's going to run up with Derrick Henry. He has all the bang routes, all the deep routes. Zay Flowers is wide open all game. All game. Right? And, and – uh, it's because that play action, right? So when you're a defender, especially at corner, you know when I'm seeing this, one, you know that you're going to have to tackle all game. Most times you play Derrick Henry, where does he want to run? He wants to come out that edge to a little yeah. corner so he can see me at the end and give me that stiff arm, right? <laughs> That's exactly what he wants. So uh, it makes it tough, man, seeing him at that home base because I know I got to feel the run fast. And then I also know that I might have deeper routes because the quarterbacks are under center, deeper play action routes. So it's hard, especially as the defense, man. You, that's why you got to be able to shut down Henry and then try to make it their team one-dimensional. And right now, teams can't do that. But what they're really doing, though, and they're masking the issues they have with their O-line. The first two right. weeks we saw, yeah. they just can't sit there and try to drop back and pass 30, 30 times a game. The one thing about the Ravens that you can't do, you can't let them get ahead because they're just going to oh, yeah. running the ball. They're just gonna keep yeah. running and running and running the ball, and then play action off of that. You gotta make them have to have to throw the ball or put the game in Lamar's hands. Even though how scary that is, the thing is, if you put the game in Lamar's hands, that puts more pressure on the O line, and that's their one weak point of the offense. And so, as long as they right. just keep this consistent run game, stay ahead of the sticks, you just keep seeing this dynamic Ravens offense. But if you can keep stopping them, get ahead a little bit early in the game, that's when you would have a chance. Right, mm-hmm. Shelby. Well, there was a in, a big injury for a defensive possible uh, MVP candidate for the NFL league wide. Shelby, tell us what happened. Man, gruesome, na- nasty injury. I'm, it's crazy because I saw it on on our flight home from Philly. Uh, you know, every, you know, all all NFL players we check up, and you know, you see you see in all the headlines on Twitter and stuff like that. But you know, Aiden Hutchinson, uh, you know. Huge, you know, lower leg injury. It was gruesome, gruesome. <laughs> just like disgusting. I, I yeah. feel for him. That's not that's not something you ever want to see. But guys, what does this do? You know, for that Lions team, does that does that hurt their chances at a Super Bowl? Does that hurt you know their future? You know, their future successes because Aiden Hudson is a big part of their defense. He was leading the league in sacks, I believe, with seven and a half. And now, well, he, he at least he ended on a sack. <laughs> I'll tell you that. At least he ended yeah, on a yeah. sack, but. Man, that gotta be that gotta be tough. That that change that changes the outlook for the Lions. Yeah, because when you look at the Lions, he he is their defense. You know, they run a lot of man, right? They um they they do a lot of pressuring, and Aiden Hutchinson, he's that guy off that edge for them, and so losing him is huge. And I I, I don't think you can win a Super Bowl without all your guys. It's, it's very mm-hmm. hard to do without all your superstars to win a, a Super Bowl. And by, even though I love the Lions this year, they smacked the Cowboys. That just mm. shows the Cowboys just aren't very good right now. And so it's going to be interesting to see what happens with this Lions team. I still think they're a contender. They should still make the playoffs, but it's hard to win a Super Bowl without without all your, your guns. Well, and Aiden Hutchinson, his performance, it bolsters the confidence of the wins you do get as a team. And Chris and I know from winning the Super Bowl with with Hall of Fame defensive ends and Demarcus Ware and and Vaughn Miller, 
that, the, that that's the intangible, intangible, right? You you can't tell when a sack is going to happen, and it affects every single pass, and it can end games in the third quarter, right? So with Aiden Hutchinson yeah. out, first and foremost, you know, hopefully he comes back completely the same player he was. I mean, that's a gruesome injury, and and there's a chance that he may never be the same player again, and that's something that he's no doubt thought about and working through and trying to tell the best story uh, as to how he can get back. But I'm kind of with Chris Harris Jr. here. It, they're, the, the Lions now are championship contenders, but you just don't have that X factor on defense. Now, Jared Goff is putting together one of the greatest stretches here in NFL history. His quarterback rating is the highest through two games in NFL history, I think since the 70s. So he's doing well, but it, as we know, it's a regular season. Things get different in the playoffs, and that's when I think that the Lions are going to miss Aiden Hutchinson the most. As I remember, if I remember correctly, wasn't it that 2013 Broncos team that made it to the Super Bowl with uh, a bunch of injuries? Obviously, it didn't it didn't work yeah. out. It didn't work out. The Seahawks yeah. ended up doing their thing, but I remember, <laughs> I do remember <laughs> a, a team that was beat up on defense that still made the Super Bowl. So don't count out the Lions. Don't count them out. Hey, yeah. but real quick, can we say fire that man, Coach McCarthy, at the Cowboys? I mean, you get drubbed at home. After having to squeak out some victories earlier in the season, he's got to go. Fire that man. But why? Well, they had Bill Belichick. They didn't want him, man. So, you know, hopefully they might knock at the door next year, you know, but it's it's he has to go, right? His offense is not – he's an offensive coach. Your offense ain't doing anything right now. Y'all chose that you didn't need a run game. If they had Derrick Henry Ooh. and Jerry Jones wasn't a little, you know, tight in his pockets, we don't know why he's so tight. Right, that little five eight million dollars <laughs> that they had for Derrick Henry, I guarantee the record would look, would look totally different now. But the Cowboys, Ooh. they got injuries on defense, man. You're talking about you missing your top two pass awesome. rushers, yeah. Like, yeah. like you, you're asking a lot of a team that's completely beat up right now on defense, you know what I mean? Like, you don't have your spark plug in Micah Parsons, and then the consistent bell cow and Demarcus Lawrence. Like, what, like, what, what can they really do? They don't have any edge rushers right now. The in, like, the D line is, is, is beat. You know what I mean? It's just, and then you're going against the Lions who will pound the ball against you. And this is the game you really need those guys. And so, you know, they were behind the eight ball before it even started. So mm. it's just, you know, we could talk about Mike McCarthy, this, Mike McCarthy, that. It'd be different if they had a fully loaded team going into this. They they are they are literally a couple band-aids from falling apart. Like we like they have to we have to see them at full full uh, potential before before we start judging them. But also I never am a big believer of firing a coach midseason because it very rarely, you know, we, we've seen it. It was the one that ran, one Raiders team that, that that went off after they fired their coach, but it very rarely, that means that you're kind of throwing in the white flag. Ah, the season's over. It's way too early. We're talking about, it's we're going into week seven. We're going into week seven. Mm -hmm. We're very rarely, like, you know, going to say the season's over already. So we got to, you know, just – Pump the brakes a little bit. Yeah, the Cowboys are in trouble because the NFC East, you know, they're, it's, it's looking a lot different than what everybody expected. <laughs> Not going to lie to you. Commanders. But yeah. they're still in it, though. They are still in it. Yeah. So, as I say, pump the brakes. Mm, I like that. I like that. You may be making me reconsider. I like that analysis, Archie, shall we? All right, let's go to third down, fellas. Big game starting off week seven is the Denver Broncos going to New Orleans. Sean Payton returns to New Orleans. And the Broncos, of course, coming off a devastating loss against the Chargers. But they did score 16 points in the fourth quarter. I liked a little bit of that. But what do you guys make of, let's just start first with the Broncos game against the Chargers. What did you see? Chris, you were there. You got to catch yeah. it all in person. How did it look to, from, from wire to wire? Man, the Chargers were well prepared. You know, I was very, you know, shocked by how disciplined they were and how they played and the communication they had on their side of the ball. Uh, Broncos, you know, we just looked like a young team. You know, uh, offense uh, didn't look well at all. No running game. Uh, Bo was a little bit, you know, I wouldn't say I would say fidgety. You know, he was he was kind of rushing it a little bit and caused him to throw a little uh, inaccuracy, inaccurate throws. And so the, they they have to clean up a lot on offense, right? But they got to be able to get the run game going. Got to get Bo more comfortable. And that happens. They need to start throwing a little bit shorter throws, get them an RPO, yeah. maybe get them a run, 
of a quarterback design run, we got to find a way to get them comfortable, right? Yeah. You don't want to start the kid out with a play action. Let's throw across the middle now, and he's inaccurate, right? And now they get a pick, and that's how that game started. So I would like them to kind of – let's kind of get him in the game. Let's throw some little screens. Let's throw some dink and dunk, some RPOs, and let's get them in the game. And once you get behind – you know how it is, man. Once you get behind 16, 20 points at half – to a uh, to a team in in the NFL, it's hard to come back. You rarely come back, and yeah. that's what happened, man. With the with the with the Broncos, they got down too far in the first half, and they're not a good enough team to be able to come back right now. Man, but what we can say though is they didn't quit. You know, they, yes, it was yeah. bad at halftime, and they didn't quit. And I think that will help you further along the season than just you know if you want you got to find the positive in this whole thing. Yeah, it was an ugly game. Yeah, They didn't quit. It's a young team that's staying in the fight. I think the epitome of a young team is you don't know who you're going to get week in and week out. You might, you, might, you might get a team that goes out yeah. there against the best competition and goes and blows them out. Or you might get a team that goes out there and, 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 and gives you a dud. But the one thing, though, is like even when they were doing giving you a dud, they sat there, they went back at halftime, and they figured it out, and they started, and they started fighting. And that's what you got to ask for for a team. Like especially a young team, because I tell you, yeah. like like I was like me and Chris always talk about. I, I'll play another four or five years in this league because these kids, these kids that come out are kind of soft. <laughs> they don't have that mm -hmm. fight, and that's the one thing yeah. you love to see with the Broncos, though, that they were fighting and that they were they yeah. were until the, until the, until the end of the game. They made it a game at the end. It's just the fact that they put yeah. they shot themselves in the foot too much early. But once again, yeah. young quarterback, you know, new new hold, new, you know. You're playing a whole new team. You're going like you're playing a hard bar coach team. They're going to be disciplined. They're going to come after you. And so, you know, I definitely think the next time around it'll be a completely different game. But if you want to look for some positives, you got to look at the fact that the Broncos never gave up. And even when things were grim, you know, they they kept fighting through it. So, you know, it's not as bad as as it could have been because they could have just laid down, could just lay yeah. down and quit. Yeah. But you got something to build on for next week, and I think that. Is, is really like, you know, what Sean Payton wanted to see, especially going against your old team. You know, you, you got to be excited for what you saw at the end of the game and you go out there and be like, all right, like we, we're, we're still in this. We, we can go out there and still make a difference, still get some wins. And so I'm, I think the Broncos will be just fine. Well, I, one of the things that we're doing, the three of us, we're having this conversation in the same arena that this is Bo Nix's first season as a quarterback. Right. I know everybody yeah. wants, a, you know, an undefeated record and they want four straight wins and five straight. I, I know that. And it's week six. OK. And you're going against a team that has a bona fide coach in Harbaugh, bona fide quarterback in Justin Herbert and, and one of the best defenses in the NFL. I mean, it was going to be a test. I'm with Chris Harris yeah. Jr. You got to you got to get Bo Nix comfortable. And a lot of that just comes from experience, you know, watching film for Bo Nix. For him to be able to stay in the pocket more, that's something he has to do. He he started he starts getting fluttery. He feels pressure, and his reactions to back up can't do that in the NFL. You cannot make that happen. Uh, but to Shelby's point, and I think all three of us are saying is, hey, look, yes, you went and, and lost a tough game against the division rivals and a division opponent in the Chargers, but you did not quit. Cortland Sutton had one of the greatest catches I think you're going to see all year in the end zone, right? Real nice. He does, and that. so. You had, yeah, he, he he's taken another level, and you had uh, other players get involved in a way offensively in that fourth quarter that you can only do if you're focused and trying to win the game. So for a young team to get that experience in week six and then have a short week now turning around against New Orleans, a team that they can really put them out for the season. I mean, New Orleans is on the brink here. They just gave up a, a ton of points. So if you're if defensively. So if you're the Broncos, not only do you take the lessons learned in that in that fight in the fourth quarter, but you got to bring it to to another level to say, hey, let's go take what we learned in that fourth quarter and put this team out for four quarters as we go into New Orleans. They're gonna have to fight this week. It's gonna be jumping in New Orleans, oh, and yeah. you know Sean Payton's coming home. Um, I think he's gonna get a good reaction. I don't know, you know, but being in, being and playing with those guys, they all loved him. Right, yeah. I never heard any. I mean, everybody in the building loves him, right? You didn't hear anything negative about the guy there, so I don't. It's, I don't think he'll get a negative reaction from the players or anything like that at all. They're gonna, I mean, they're gonna be excited to see him, you know, from just hearing uh, playing with those guys. 
Maybe. But they're, Broncos are going to have to fight, man. Thursday night, it's going to be tough, Bo. It's going to be rocking in uh, New Orleans, and they're going to have to bring their A game, right? We're going to definitely going to need that run game. Uh, they're going to be able, they're going to have to do way better on third down. Third down is what's killing the Broncos offensively and defensively. They can't get off the field on third down, and they can't keep drives alive on offense yeah. right right now. So those are the major issues. Um, and you know the Saints giving up fifty one points. Ooh, right. They gonna come back ready. They yeah. gonna come back ready this Thursday night. So it's gonna be a tough game. I'm excited to see it though. It's gonna be it's gonna be a good one. Not just fifty one points. They got over two hundred and fifty yards rushing. Yeah, two hundred and fifty <laughs> yards rushing. And this is where the Broncos have to exploit this because the Broncos have yeah. not been the best rushing team in, at all. So they got to get this run game going because obviously there's something going on in New Orleans where you can run the ball. And we all know, mm-hmm. that, yeah. you know, that they you, when you have a performance like that the week before, the emphasis is going to be on stopping the run. And so, you know what I mean? So stop mm-hmm. the run. And and I, like you said, it's gonna, you got to get Bo Nix comfortable, slow him down a little bit, slow down just how he – you know all the all his processing, make it easy for him. You know, run the ball, yeah. open like make the linebackers step up, throw it over their heads, and just you know make it a simple game plan. But even talking about Thursday nights, we all know how tough that can be to try to transition from playing Sunday to playing Ooh. Thursday. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it's it's a tough transition. You know, like Ryan as a big dude, what what are the what are the hardships to trying to flip it on from playing Sunday to playing Thursday? Getting out of bed, right? I mean, you're sore. You're still sore from the game. I mean, I remember, especially later in my career, the, la- the later Thursday night games. Woo! You, I mean, you're, you you got a lot of vets with the heating pads on the knees and back before the game. You know what I mean? You're, you're stretching, and hopefully the coaches aren't trying to grind you into the ground. The whole schedule changes. But the big thing is mentally, you got to get over the f- – you're playing on Thursday. You know, like mentally, that's where you got to be. Like, you just have to – understand and tell your body to, to get right before that game i used to love the thursday night just because i'm like i used to put it in my head if i go hard these two games i get a nice weekend <laughs> yeah, a little you know yeah. <laughs> so that used to you know I, that was my mentality like man let's try to knock out two good games and let's have a nice little weekend hopefully i can you know go back home you know sneak out sneak out you know a little fast but uh, the, these games are always – you're always going to be sore. Everybody's going to be banged up. You know, you just game it. You got to mentally get your mind right and just fight through it, right? Pretty much the whole and the whole season is almost like that, you know. But it's just – you know, it's, it's harder to come back from those games. And uh, they used to do us bad. We'd have like a Sunday night game. Then now yeah. you got to go play Thursday, you know, On or road, traveling yeah. real yeah. far, far trip. And then, bam, we got a Thursday night game. So, I mean, luckily the Broncos, they had a home game and they can, you know, get some rest and then now go to New Orleans on Wednesday. Uh, we did. I, I was unfortunately, uh, they put us and put me in a lot of bad situations where we didn't have a lot of time to recover. So mm-hmm. it just depends on how the schedule is. And, and uh, But the Thursday night games are, it's, it's prime time. It's going to be a good game. We're going to see if Sean Payton, the, you know, he's going to be the talk of the town. I think when they showed the pregame, they had Sean Payton, and they had Derek Carr, you know. <laughs> so uh, they they treat Sean Payton like he's the quarterback this game. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yes, they are. Well, Man, hey guys, for like... fourth down, let's wrap it up. The international games. I thought we might get another coach fired from an international game when the Jaguars took that L, <laughs> but clearly they're not going anywhere. It was strange to see the Jets. You know that two weeks ago they had the international game, and then already they're playing uh, on Monday night. What do you guys make of the international game, and is it here to stay? Man, it's money. They're going to stay. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're trying yeah. to, you know, they're doing it under, under the guise of we're trying to expand the game. No, you're trying to expand the markets to make some money. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's really all it is. You're just trying to make more money. But it's, you know, it's it's, it's a cool experience for, for the guys who haven't, you know, haven't been able to travel, go around, go see different places. Except you know, other than the Brazil game where, you know, they were told they really couldn't leave the hotel very much. You know, usually you go to these games. You know, I remember when I was with the Raiders, we were to London, and we went for the we played the Patriots the week before in Boston, and we flew right out, and we were there for the whole week, and so that was a real cool experience. I always say the issue is that most people don't give a shit about the game. <laughs> like, like, like to be like, you go there and you're 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 enjoying. It's like a vacation, then then you have to work. I feel like people lose the focus of what we're actually here for. 
And so then that's why you see these ugly games on all these international games. And then you also you got the jet lag, people, you know, you, you, six hours ahead. It, it's just it's, it's a tough game to stay focused for, but they're not going anywhere. We actually will see more of them as, as the years come on in different places. But, you know, I like I liked it because I remember, well, when I was with the Seahawks, we, we played in Germany. I thought that was really cool. And, you know, it's just – but the issue is the food wasn't the greatest. <laughs> and, mm. you, you, like, you know what I mean? Like, sometimes you're stuck eating the food that they give you. And as most of us know, when you go to an away game, even in the States, if you're eating hotel food, you're not really getting – you're not eating the best food that they got. So it's just uh, – it's, it's tough, but it's, it's an experience. And I always remember when we played in Germany, uh, right before – like, right after the two-minute warning, they broke out in this whole song – um, you know, just um, like the West Virginia, like that, like I'm talking about, it was like bone chilling. Like I, that was like, I, I will remember that moment for the rest of my life, just being on the field and then breaking out this whole song, everybody singing it together. It's just a different feel than, you know, when you're in America playing, but you know, it's, it's, it's hard to stay focused when, when you're, when you're in a different country, you, <laughs> you can't stay in your schedule, you know, but it's, you know, they're not going anywhere. So we got to find ways to adapt. Man, I played twelve years and didn't get to play one international game. You know, so Ooh. I don't I don't even have any I can't even speak on this topic, man. You know, I didn't have the chance to play in the international games, but I do think they're gonna continue to stay, like Shelby saying. Um uh it's kinda like the NBA. You know, they wanted to get worldwide, have all the international uh players eventually start coming over here. You know, it's kinda like the beginning of that. So uh, Spain. What else did they say they want to play? They're they playing get in China. Brazil. They want to get yeah, Brazil, yeah. Mexico. You know they got to play in China, right? That's a big market. Mm-hmm. We seen yeah. how the the NBA has partnered with China and how big that is over there, right? Yeah. So um, these guys got China shoes, right? You know, uh, you know, we seen what Stephon Marbury and all these guys have built over there. So it's gonna be. I think it's gonna be a way to put more money in guys' pockets, also. Right, playing uh, international and getting these games all over the world. So, I think it is a cool thing. Uh, but I'm just mad I didn't get to play in one game. Yeah, well, I love playing in it. It was an amazing experience. You think we like football, man? They really like football over there in Europe. Those stadiums are incredible. Uh, it's tough on the players, but one of the things people fans don't fans miss too. A lot of players don't have their passport. You got about 15 to 20 guys every every mm-hmm. international game. They're like, "What do you mean passport? What do I need?" So. It's a great experience. It stretches the minds of the players. It increases the love and the passion in the world of football in the NFL. And it is absolutely here to stay because, like Shelby said, it's all about the money. Man, that's but actually this, how that's I this got week. my passport. That's actually how I got my passport. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> See? My See? My rookie year, I remember after I got drafted by the Raiders. It was just like, yeah, you know, we're going to have a game in London. Do you have your passport? I was like, no. So, literally, my, that passport just expired last year. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? So, it's like. Woo. And so that, and that's the crazy part about it is, you know, it's a, a lot of the players when they come into the league, they have not been able to travel. They have never been, you know, overseas, you know, and like all the most traveling you're doing is for football. So that's why mm-hmm. when I say it's kind of a distraction sometimes because some people know they might never come back here again and they want to go see yeah. the sites. Like yeah. you say, you go to London, you want to go see Big Ben, you know, you want to go, you want to go around and, and, and ride on the buses and do all that stuff. Like, but you know, it's, it, but they're there for a job and, and that's where the, the, the fine line is, though, is because you obviously – some you got some coaches that be like, oh, go have some fun. We have, work. We, have our, we have work for a small window, and then you guys can go do whatever you want. And you have some coaches that try to fill up your day because they're like, we need you to be focused. You know, or they try to get there late. Let's say you play a game on Sunday, you'll, you'll leave and get there Thursday. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's Worst tough, way but you do it. it's cool. Yeah, it's it's, an, it's a great environment, but I hate when coaches leave in the week. Sleep on the plane. Yeah, right. We're going to London, man. You know, we're going on, we're going over, we're going across the border. You can't sleep on the plane. Everybody's excited. But that's our episode for this week of We're the Harrises. Thanks for joining us. Make sure to follow us on social media, uh, like and subscribe on YouTube, and make sure to share it with some friends as well so they know where they can get the best football talk in the NFL and beyond.